Welcome to the Matchwish Waters Historical Society's screencast, Threads of History, the seventh installment of our series, History and Evolution of the Manitwish Chain, will focus on early land and water surveys. By the late 1850s and early 1860s, the federal government was busy documenting properties recently gained through treaties with the Ojibwa Nation, keeping copious notes in their notebooks, including cultural information and key coordinates, the North Woods was mapped for the first time. The map that you see on the right is an 1862 survey map of the township of Manitouish Waters. Just for some bearing, the yellow arrow is pointed at Manitouish Lake, the orange arrow at Rest Lake, and the blue arrow at the small portion of Island Lake that is within the township of Manitouish Waters. These maps may seem sketchy, but they're really interesting, particularly when coupled with those great notebooks that the original surveyors kept. To the right is an example of the trig maps, which are modern maps created by the trig map company from Ely, Minnesota. They illustrate a composite of all the information from the original land surveys and the cultural information that were in the notebooks as well. This is a great resource for any Northwoods household or visitor to be able to go back in time and take a look at the baseline information that we have available from a period back to the Civil War. Witness trees once covered America, and today for many, their importance is lost. You can see in this slide an example of a witness tree in Michigan and these trees were used as part of establishing the boundaries of the original surveys and some following surveys. Witness trees were codified by the Continental Congress for establishing property boundaries throughout the United States of America, marking the section, township, and range all on the cambrium of the trees. A close-up of witness trees, as seen here with an old-growth hemlock in the Van Vliet Hemlock Forest, shows both marks on this large tree. Underneath those wounds or those blazes are the same data points of township range and section in size in the cambrium of the tree. In addition to marking section lines, the original surveyors also marked meander lines. That's anywhere that a section line would bisect a lake or stream. Again, in this example, we have modern markers of a steel pipe and brass cap and a plastic post. These smaller trees that are blazed as witness trees really illustrate follow-up surveys all the way into the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, great historian and DNR worker Paul Brenner did many of these surveys during his tenure after serving in World War II. As I said before, today's survey markers here close up. On the right, you see both the brass cap steel pipe and the plastic post. And we have a close-up of a steel pipe with the information of the township range and section number right there. Old growth witness trees date back to the original surveys and can be a little tricky to see. Again, taking some images from Van Vliet Hemlocks, we can see on the far right, marked by yellow arrows, the old scars on this hemlock. Sometimes to the left, you see that modern surveyors will actually open those scars up with an ax and blaze them with various colors of paint, making it easy for the traveler or historian moving through the woods today to locate these unique 
culturally modified trees that serve as artifacts from our past. Some of these trees are still standing along section corners and meander lines along the Manitouis chain for you to explore. The next coverage of surveys will be on an elaborate water survey conducted by the Army Corps of Engineers in 1878 part of a review of all watersheds of the upper Mississippi River. Here are two images specifically from the Manitouish chain that resulted from these explorations. Before we get started, it's important to get some baseline context. And this comes from A.B. Gray, a geologist who traveled in 1846 through the Manitouish chain. He described moving from Six Paws Portage near today's Manitouish, Wisconsin, what the water was like. Opening into small and picturesque lakes surrounded by high land with excellent pineries and narrowing again to a width barely sufficient for the passage of a canoe. The big takeaway here is that the channels that connect the Manitouish chain today and many of the rivers and streams were much smaller, barely sufficient for the passage of a canoe. Putting that in context with the size and scope of channels and streams today, we're going to see that when the dams do come and modify the land, their impact will be significant. Early on, there was a problem that was identified downstream on the Chippewa River. It seems that loggers, some of them timber trespassing, were running loose logs down the river, creating dams that were temporary, backing up huge amounts of water, and then unleashing them seemingly all at the same time with a process known as flashing them downstream. This had a terrible impact on navigation on the Chippewa River. Complaints from Eau Claire were as follows. One day, all the boats and steamboats would be laying on the river bottom as the dams from the loggers held back the water. A day or two later, the whole town would flood as the loggers released their water. Clearly, a solution was needed. For context, here's one of those temporary dams that were used by loggers in the River Drive era. You can see them standing on uh, white pine bolts that would hold back the water and then would be released to flash downstream. The impact of this flashing downstream is very evident on the inlet of the Manitouish River to both Benson and Sturgeon Lakes. Here at Benson Lake, there is a huge sand bar that flattens out upon the inlet to the lake. These are a result of this flashing process. Today, canoers on the Manitouish River can discover the sandbars and results of river drive logging as they make their way downstream. In 1879, the congressional record posted that the Manitouish above the junction of Rest Lake was another excellent dam site, and they made an extensive survey. Enthusiasm regarding the Rest Lake Dam area began to grow. Below the dam, as marked by the yellow arrow on the right or to the east, all the way down to the junction with the Flambeau River, shows the downstream gradient from Rest Lake to that point as 18.7 feet. Several rapids and drops existed and were recorded by the Army Corps of Engineers. Preference for the Rest Lake Reservoir continued in the congressional record as more and more data came forward showing the possibility of creating a massive flowage. The data tables showed that the water rise could go as high as 25 feet, quite a bit higher than the eight feet that the dam is raised today. 
the Army Corps of Engineers actually drew a map showing what a 25-foot head of water would look on the Manitouche chain. We're lucky as residents of this area to be able to get this kind of detailed information from the 19th century. The dam was also located at a different place, as you see by the yellow arrow, at the outlet of Vance Lake. The red lines around Rest Lake, Dole or Clear Lake, Island Lake, Manitouish, all the way up to Wild Rice, shows a very different footprint than would exist today. On Manitouish River, at the outlet of Rest Lake, in this case Vance Lake, they proposed then the dam to be limited to only 15 feet in height and 250 feet in length. It also required a large dike to cover up an area that would have had the water flow around from Vance Lake. Ultimately, the 1878 dam site, as marked on the left with the yellow arrow, will migrate, if you look to the right, to where the red arrow was in 1887. This will be developed in depth when we discuss the creation of dams and river drive logging and the evolution of the dam in later screencasts on the threads of history. The next series of slides documents the original lakeshore levels before the dam. We will journey from lake to lake along documented portions of the Manitouish chain, analyzing baseline data from Allen's 1878 expedition. Here's how it works. This table was included with the map of Rest Lake. This map hangs at the Kohler Library for your viewing. If you look at the yellow arrow on the left, that shows the name of the lake. This is Little Rest Lake, as it's called. It's actually Vance Lake. The blue arrow on the right actually shows in feet how much of a rise there is between each body of water. The blue arrow is marking a rapids that we'll explore in a few slides that existed on the channel between Rest and Stone Lake. And then the orangish arrow on the upper right on Little Man Lake number one, which is actually Stone Lake, will show how you progress backwards from the dam upstream and you're able to identify most all the lakes in the chain and the specific rise in water from the original dam. So Vance Lake or Little Rest Lake is marked in bright yellow on the far left and it had the same water level as Rest Lake and that establishes a baseline for where the dam will go. And after this dam, the gradients will go forward. Here's an image from the 1878 map in orange showing Little Rest Lake or Vance Lake where the dam was proposed and actually Rest Lake itself on the right. The site of the historic rapids is kind of a fun thing to explore. If you look at the Google satellite map, I have an arrow right where that would be near Michaelis's resort. And you can see it also on the 1878 chart showing the gradient between the Manitouish chain of lakes. Little man number one, Stone Lake, is marked in blue. Little man number two lake is Spider Lake and is marked in orange. This shows basically flat water between those two points. It remains flat into, as you go to Manitouish Lake, which is marked with the yellow arrow. So those are somewhat stable. But if you look at Dole Lake, which was actually Clear Lake, there's a great rise that takes place at that time. Actually, it's a three foot rise from Stone Lake to Clear Lake, suggesting with the red arrows, the data points, 
that there was a strong current between Clear and Stone Lake. Both Fawn and Little Star Lake were not formally recorded in the 1878 survey. And as often the case in the 19th century, Little Star Lake was grouped with Manitouish Lake. Island Lake was measured at 5.4 feet higher than Rust Lake. The yellow arrow illustrates the rise of Island Lake out of Spider Lake and Manitouish Lake Basin. This height was probably part of a large rapids at the outlet of the Manitouish River from Island Lake where the large rocks are grouped. Considering if a 25 foot dam had been put in place, the red line illustrates how much larger Island Lake, the largest lake currently on the chain, would have been more than doubled in size. Mud Lake 1, Alder Lake, was 5.4 feet above Rest Lake, marked by the yellow arrow. The orange arrow is Mud Lake number 2, or Wild Rice Lake. It was 7.3 feet above Rest Lake, again suggesting that there would have been a strong gradient. Looking at the map that was created in 1878, you would imagine that the stream between Wild Rice and Alder Lakes would have had a lot of swifts and a brisk current. Today, the Manitouche Waters Historical Society has attempted to make a pre-dam estimation of the chain's water levels. To the left, you'll see all of the different lakes listed and the seasonal difference, whether winter or summer levels, based on the data from 1878 and how much we raise and lower the water levels today. You can notice on the winter levels, both clear and wild rice are below the original shoreline. This may cause some of the viewers to wonder how that could be. I would uh, hearken you back to the discussion of flashing logs downstream and the discussion how the channels used to be barely sufficient for the width of a canoe. And then the water level, as we'll explore in a later Threads of History, being raised up to 16 feet annually and released in a matter of days. This will carve out huge blocks of land on the lakes and streams that make the Manitouish chain, creating sand piles, sandbars, and alike, and dramatically modifying the lakes and lake levels, thus accounting for Clear and Wild Rice Lake actually being below the original shoreline level because of the sandbars that block the original flow. In summary, between the late 1850s and mid-1860s, the U.S. government generated detailed surveys of the Manitouish chain, leaving witness trees as markers for us to follow still today. In 1878, in response to the growing demand for managed water resources, the Army Corps of Engineers researched numerous watersheds and settled on parts of the Manitouish chain, specifically Rest Lake, as among the best dam sites for a flowage in the upper Mississippi River Basin. And finally, the Allen Expedition followed up on a survey with detailed maps and recording numerous data points of water levels that reveals for us today key insights into the original physical setting of the Manitouish chain. We hope you enjoyed this presentation on threads of history, the history and evolution of the Manitouish chain, focusing on early land and water surveys. You can join our team or get a free newsletter from us electronically. And always please visit our website by clicking on the appropriate link on the slide.